And let's start also with questions. We're starting the chapter on differential equations. Um, so is there a uh, question? There don't seem to be very many students tuned in. Um, I hope you realize uh, fall break is Thursday and Friday, so there's no class on Thursday, but we do have class on Wednesday tomorrow. Um, so uh, differential equations um, is a funny kind of topic. Um, it's sort of the opposite of complex variable theory. In complex variable theory, you start with one concept and you get a zillion conclusions. Uh, in the case of ordinary, or in case of differential equations, um, any way to solve any particular, there are many, many, there are zillions of differential equations, any way to solve any one of them is fine. If you can solve it, great. You don't, you don't need to justify the solution or the method. Um, any trick you can find to solve any particular differential equation is fine. Um, and the result is that the field is, um, it's just, it's very, di it's diverse. It's not like complex, it's the opposite of complex variable theory where everything follows from one concept. Um, so I'm gonna start with some definitions. Um, uh, if you have an operator like this involving derivatives multiplied by functions, we call this an nth order nth because the highest derivative is the nth derivative, ordinary linear differential equation. It's an ordinary differential equation because there's only one independent variable x, all the derivatives are with respect to x. And um, it's linear because derivatives are linear operators. And um, Because it's linear, you have a chance of solving the thing. And um, moreover, because what linear means here is that L on a constant times one function plus another constant times the other function is the constant L on the first function plus the second constant L on the second function. Now, um, if all of these H's I change from M to, to J and uh, did not finish. Anyway, if all of these coefficients are, are constants, then this becomes a much simpler, uh, uh, it, it's, it's then an nth order ordinary linear differential operator with constant coefficients. And we saw in section four, eight, we could solve those very easily. Uh, an example is uh, this uh, equation, which has sines and cosines as solutions. A more general uh, second order linear differential operator is um, of this form. And uh, this is not uh, homogeneous uh, because of the extra term, uh, well, no, I should not say that. I, I said that it was, um, this is actually homogeneous. All right, anyway, the differential equation up here, this is homogeneous because, um, oh, sorry. This is homogeneous because uh, all the terms are um, linear in F or its derivatives. Um, on the other hand, if you have something of the form LF equals S, where S is a, function that's independent of x, then uh, this is an inhomogeneous uh, linear ordinary differential equation because of the source term s. Now, 
if a linear, if a differential equation is linear and homogeneous, then we can add solutions. And so if F1 is a solution and F2 is a solution, then any linear combination is a solution because the differential operator is linear. So L on F, L on the sum is the sum of L on each solution and each thing is a solution. So we get zero. So this, this means that um, it's possible to find general solutions of linear homogeneous differential equations. And an example is of course, this uh, sines and cosines uh, equation, um, or this equation which has sines and cosines as the solution. Now, um, n functions are linearly independent if the only numbers for which the linear combination vanishes for all x are all the k's equal to zero. Otherwise, they're linearly uh, dependent. And um, of course, in general, if you take n functions, uh, they're all different. They're almost always linearly independent because uh, a function of x, even if uh, x is a function defined on the real line, is equivalent to an infinite dimensional vector. And so if you have n infinite dimensional vectors. They're almost always linearly independent. Anyhow, um, suppose you have an nth order linear homogeneous, that means no source term, ordinary, no partial derivatives, differential equation, um, and you have n linearly independent solutions and that all the other solutions to this ordinary linear differential equation are linear combinations of these n solutions. Then we say these n solutions are complete in the space of solutions of this equation and form a basis for this space. And uh, the general solution of the linear differential equation is then a sum of uh, constants times each of the uh, individual solutions. Let me make this a little bit bigger so that it's easier for you guys to see the text. Um, if you have a source term on the other hand, then it's an inhomogeneous linear ordinary differential equation. And here um, there's a uh, standard result, namely that if, if you have two solutions of this inhomogeneous differential equation, as I say, two solutions of this equation I stands for inhomogeneous. Um, oh God, I stands for inhomogeneous, and um, it's not an index that runs over the integers. So you have two solutions, f1 and f2, of this inhomogeneous differential equation. Then their difference is evidently a solution of the homogeneous differential equation. And if we have, we know what the most if we have the most general solution of the homogeneous equation, then the difference of two solutions of the inhomogeneous equation must be expressible in this way. And therefore we can write F1 as F2 plus this sum here. And that means then that an arbitrary solution of the inhomogeneous differential equation is the general solution of the homogeneous equation plus any old particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation. So that's, uh, that's a property. So in other words, if you have an inhomogeneous differential equation, it's almost as good as a uh, homogeneous equation, as long as you can find at least one solution, because then you're home free if you can solve the linear uh, equation. And uh, so that's, that's the situation. Now, so these, non, these linear equations are basically soluble. I mean, sometimes you have to work a lot. Sometimes you, need, you can only uh, figure out how to express them as an infinite series. But um, if you huff and puff enough, you can, you can solve them. And the, the ones that occur 
frequently in mathematics, physics, engineering are um, ones that have been worked on, the solutions are well known and you can look them up one way or another. Um, Nonlinear differential equations are totally different and they're much harder in general and you can't add them together. And so if you found one, or you say you found two solutions to a particular nonlinear differential equation, you can't add them together. And so, so the, the space, uh, the, the problem of solving nonlinear differential equations is, uh, is, is, a, is a very serious, uh, it's, it's these nonlinear differential equations are very hard in general. Um, uh, I, I wonder whether at some point some group will just start generating solutions of nonlinear differential equations and then just tabulating them somewhere in some huge, uh, I don't know, uh, say Amazon's web services, AWS, you know, just sort of put them all there and um, or put you know, millions of them there. And then they were properly indexed. Um, one, could, one, could solve, one could find solutions to not various nonlinear equations because one had solved them. Um, uh, anyway, um, so these are examples of, of nonlinear differential equations. The function f can occur in a nonlinear way as the argument of an exponential. The derivative can be squared. The function can be cubed. These are all nonlinear and they're in general very, very hard, but they're also for that reason, interesting. Um, they can, be, because um, we don't know much about nonlinear differential equations, whenever we solve one of them, not whenever, but often when, one solves a nonlinear differential equation somehow, uh, one discovers something new because um, in many cases, no one's ever seen the solution before. Okay, uh, linear partial differential equations. Now, of course, a partial differential equation is a whole differential equation, it just in which uh, you have partial derivatives occurring and similarly a partial differential equation a partial derivative is a whole derivative with the other independent variables held constant um, here i'm using an abbreviation x to stand for the k independent variables and uh, n to stand for k uh, the sum of n independent um in fact, I didn't even need that n. So uh, I don't know why I said, oh yes, it's of order n because uh, the sum of all the n's uh, represents the highest derivative involved. Anyhow, um, this is a homogeneous equation and so, and it's linear. Um, so you can once again, add solutions if, F1 and F2 are solutions, then a constant times F1 plus another constant times F2 is a solution. Um, so additivity of solutions is a property of all linear homogeneous differential equations, whether ordinary or partial. And the, the inhomogeneous case is not that much more difficult. Um, suppose, first of all, notice that the general solution of a linear homogeneous partial differential equation like this is um, a sum over a complete set of solutions with arbitrary coefficients. And consequently, the linear, the, a linear part of the inhomogeneous equation with a source term uh, can be solved in the same way as we did the case of uh, an ordinary differential equation with a source term, namely that if you have, if, if there are two solutions of the 
inhomogeneous equation, then the difference is a solution of the homogeneous equation. You can write it like this. And consequently, uh, the general solution of the inhomogeneous equation is any particular solution of the inhomogeneous equation plus the general solution of the homogeneous equation. So um, that's uh, how, the, how that works. Now, um, still partial differential equations are harder than ordinary differential equations. Um, and the way we cope with partial differential equations is we separate them. Uh, if we can. And um, a, a homogeneous linear partial differential equation in n variables is separable if it can be de decomposed into n ordinary differential equations, one for each of the variables. And um, if suitable products of these solutions is a solution. And um, the general solution then is a sum of all the linearly independent solutions. Here I'm thinking of the uh, homogeneous case. Maybe I should have said that, so 7.18. Uh, ah, I said homogeneous, so homogeneous there. Um, in general, the separability of a partial differential equation depends upon the uh, choice of coordinates. Um, and many of the partial differential equations, classical and quantum field theory are separable in several coordinate systems because they have rotational symmetry and involve a Laplacian, the divergence of the gradient operator, in other words. An example is uh, Laplace's equation for the electrostatic potential in empty space, and that is just uh, grad squared of phi vanishes. And if you write it in um, uh, rectangular coordinates, then it is obviously a, uh, uh, well, it, it, I, I guess it's already separable because it's, it's clear that, uh, well, what you do is you write phi as a function. Of, yeah. Hello? Okay, you can write it as a function of X times a function of Y times a function of Z. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. Poisson's equation uh, also involves a little Laplacian and uh, it expresses the uh, electrostatic potential in terms of the charge density. And uh, Maxwell's equations um, uh, also involve a Laplacian. Here I'm writing Laplacian as a divergence of gradient, and it's just in rectangular coordinates, the sum of the second derivatives. Um, and uh, Maxwell's equations, of course, in empty space imply the wave equations. And these are separable in many coordinate systems, rectangular, cylindrical, spherical. And for instance, the exponentials uh, are solutions of these equations. So these are plane wave solutions. Um, Helmholtz's equation in two dimensions, rectangular coordinates looks like this. Here we have a K squared here, but still it's not a source term. So it's a homogeneous equation. And it's, of course, linear in F, which is the important thing. So you write F as X times Y. And then when you carry out the differentiation, you see you have an equation that looks like this. Well, what you do is you then divide by the product of the X function times the Y function. And when you do that, maybe I should just, in this particular case, um, just draw what, what actually happens. When you divide by xy, you get minus one over x partial to x partial x squared minus one over y partial to y partial y squared equals just k squared. 
So this is a constant, obviously. This is just a function of y. This is a function of x. So as a result, the only way that this can be solved is that this is one constant and this is another constant. And the two constants add up to k squared. And so what one typically, what one way of solving this to say, well, let x, x be uh, e to the i a x and b equal to e to the i b y. And of course, in general, one can say a is just a complex number. And then you get the equation a squared plus b squared equals k squared. And uh, there you'll have a solution for any um, two complex numbers, a and b, that happen to satisfy this uh, expression, this equation. Um, Hamholtz's equation is also soluble in polar coordinates. Um, which is the three-dimensional Laplacian without the z derivative, so it looks like this in two dimensions. You then do the same trick. You substitute. You let f equal rho times phi. This is capital Greek rho, and um, you then multiply both sides by rho squared over rho phi, and what you get is an expression like this. Um, and now these two things are, well, these three things are functions of rho. This is a constant. This is just a function of phi. So this has to be a constant. This has to be a constant. And the constants has to satisfy this equation. Um, so we let phi double pro, phi equal to e to the i n phi. And it turns out that rho is actually a non-trivial function. It's a Bessel function. It's not a simple exponential. And uh, it solves this equation because the Bessel function of the first kind, Jn, satisfies this equation. We'll talk about Bessel functions in chapter 10. Um, but to get back to this um, n, n we usually set equal to an integer. And there's a subtlety here. If we're dealing with if we're dealing with 360 degrees or pi, in other words, if the angle phi, if the physical region has phi, uh, all values of phi, uh, then we want phi to be single valued. Uh, and, if, and in that case, um, n has to be an integer because we want um, e to the i uh, 2 pi n to equal e to the 0, which is equal to 1. And um, on the other hand, sometimes one is dealing with a situation in which there's a region in which one is just dealing with a certain fraction of the region. In other words, one might be dealing with this region. And over here, this is not part of the problem, the black part. And um, consequently, uh, here, uh, phi not, need not be an integer. So uh, let me switch and just say, uh, uh, phi need not be an integer. Of course, if you set phi not equal to an integer, then you've got something here that's simply uh, square of a real number, or conceivably square of a complex number, and then you don't obviously have uh, you don't have the simple Bessel function with integer index, you, you're dealing with a, a Bessel function of a fractional index or even a complex index. But in general, it's typically that you're dealing with uh, all, all angles and n is an integer. We go now to three dimensions where we typically feel a little more comfortable. Um, 
Then uh, in rectangular coordinates, Helmholtz's equation just looks like this. We write F as X, Y, Z. Um, and then the Laplacian just X twice on the X, twice on the Y, twice on the Z. We just add them together. And then we divide by X, Y, Z. And then we get an expression which, um, uh, here maybe I'll draw a yellow line, which is, um, once again, uh, when we divide this equation by x, y, z, we get minus x double prime over x, minus y double prime over y, minus z double prime over z equals k squared. So this is a constant. This is a function of z, so constant. Damn, so annoying the way that happens constant function of y, function of x. And so all four have to be constants. And then, so we just say minus x double prime is equal to x times uh, something. And what I said, what I chose was a squared. And um, the condition then is a squared plus b squared plus c squared is equal to k squared. And these uh, ABCs can be um, complex, actually, but, but they have to add up to k squared. Um, in cylindrical coordinates, what we have is this equation. And once again, we write it as rho phi z, and we divide by rho phi z. And so then we get this expression here. This is a... That's strange. Um, this is actually a little more puzzling than, um, than I, God, I hope I got this right. Um, it, it looks a little bit funny. This thing is only a function of phi. Um, this is only a function of rho. This is a function of rho and z, and this is a function of rho. Um, might be a clearer way of saying this. In any event, we set z equal to e to the alpha z. Then we get something uh, simpler. This is just alpha squared. So then we have a, uh, a function of rho and a very simple function. Well, we've solved the function of z. In fact, um, in fact, there's no longer a z. It's just a fun uh, z double prime over z is a constant. And, um, so then what remains is just a uh, Bessel function. And um, again, n must be an integer if, <clears throat> if you want phi to be single valued over the whole region, over all angles, zero to two pi. Um, if you set k equal to zero, you get back to Laplace's equation. Um, and in that case, um, you, uh, you, you have a solution that's simply that. Um, it, 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 once again, if you said, z, z, oh, I said z equal to alpha z in this case. If you said z equal to e to the i alpha z, alpha being, I took alpha real in both cases, then um, you get, then this thing doesn't give you this. Instead, you want a solution like this and the alpha, the second derivative of z gives you a minus alpha squared. So k squared gets plus alpha squared turns into k squared minus alpha squared. Um, and things get more subtle if alpha happens to be bigger than k squared because then we've got a Bessel function of an imaginary argument. And um, this is then said to be a modified Bessel function. Um, Helmholtz's equation, of course, is also separable in spherical coordinates, and in spherical coordinates, it's you know, that that's something that we use a great deal um, because many problems have spherical symmetry, and um, so the Laplacian is in spherical coordinates looks like this. 
By the way, this first term you could rewrite as one over R times the second R derivative of R times F. That sometimes uh, makes the computation simpler. So we said F equal to R theta phi. We let phi equal to e to the i m phi, where again, m is an integer if all two pi makes sense. Um, or if the problem involves all two pi, and then we want phi to be single valued. Uh, we then multiply both sides by minus r squared over r phi theta, r theta phi, and we get this expression, function of r, function of theta, function of theta, function of r. And so this, all of this has to be a constant and the functions of r have to be a constant. And what you do is you set uh, the r dependent terms equal to a constant, and I'm choosing the constant to be LL plus one minus K squared. The theta terms I'm setting equal to minus L, L plus one. And so then the function capital theta has to satisfy this equation. Um, once again, M typically is an integer and L also must be an integer in this range uh, if theta is to be single valued and finite in that range. And um, in quantum mechanics class, you'll uh, often uh, see this condition and it, it comes from the properties of this function, uh, which is the associated Legendre function, just a function of theta, by the way. Um, so then the product r theta phi obeys Helmholtz's equation, as long as the radial function satisfies this equation, and um, it will, because J sub L, which is the spherical Bessel function, obeys uh, Bessel's equation, Bessel's spherical, the, the equation for Bessel's spherical function. Um, on a spherical Bessel function. Anyway, um, when you, uh, by the way, when, uh, when you have something that has a lot of symmetry, like uh, three-dimensional rotational symmetry, then typically the function is simpler. So we'll see that the little JLs are quite nice functions, whereas the capital JL, because they only have cylindrical symmetry, are considerably more complicated. There's a typo in the book. I somehow wrote X instead of P a couple of times here. Um, so I wanna explain some of this notation to you because um, in special relativity and electrodynamics, when you're dealing with relativistic problems and in general relativity, um, a notation like this is used. So the derivative, um, the derivative with a lower index is the derivative with, well, first of all, what are the coordinates? The coordinates are typically ec written with upper indexes when we are dealing with relativity. And um, these ones with upper indexes each coordinate by, by uh, we, we don't have any hidden minus signs, okay? X zero is whatever the time coordinate is. And these are the three spatial coordinates. Um, one can form in special relativity, the invariant in a product PX as the dot product of the three momentum with the three position minus the energy times the time, and it looks like that. And um, that is written typically as P lower A, X upper A, where P lower A has, has this minus sign hidden in the lowness of the index A. And of course, this is Einstein's summation convention, namely that if you have an index that's repeated, once upper and once lower, then you sum from zero to three. 
Um, that's how Einstein originally wrote his summation convention, but people in um, uh, theoretical physics have um, extended it so that if anything is repeated an even number of, well, if anything is repeated once, uh, you, you sum over it. Um, so um, if you have a lower zero, then it has a hidden minus sign, this minus sign, X lower zero minus sign. This lower derivative is the ordinary derivative. On the other hand, this a derivative with an upper sign is has a is a derivative with respect to the x with a lower index, and consequently this x has a hidden minus sign, so you get a minus sign there. Um, to make matters worse, um, half or three quarters, or I don't know, of uh, the Physicists in this world um, choose this convention, P0, X0 minus P dot X. So both conventions are used. In general relativity, this equation, uh, this convention is typically used in particle physics. This convention is often used, and maybe I, don't, I haven't taken a poll, but one could say typically. Um, I think this is obviously the better convention because we have three plus signs, one minus sign. Here we have three minus signs, one plus sign. So it seems to me it's obvious which is the better equation. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some differential equations that occur in physics. Um, one is the Klein-Gordon equation. And um, by the way, Minkowski space is just a fancy word for flat space or the space of special relativity. Natural units, I've already talked about H bar and C equal to one, although they're really Planck units. And he said Newton's constant equal to one. Um, anyway, the, the the divergence of the gradient is often written, abbreviated as Laplacian, so a triangle. And when you go to four dimensions and subtract the second time derivative, well, people write it as a box. So um, this has, Laplacian has three derivatives, so you have three sides of the triangle. The Dalembertian has four derivatives, so you have four sides to the square, and it looks like this. You can write it this way, and the lower index means that if you have a, when the index is zero, you have a hidden minus sign, and that shows up here. So that looks like that. Um, the Klein Gordon equation is box minus m squared on some function of space time. Equals zero, uh, equals zero. If you set A equal to uh, Px, where Px, of course, is this invariant inner product, then the kth partial derivative is Pk times the derivative of B. So partial of A with respect to xk is, is, the, is this, which is then Pk times the derivative of B with respect to its argument Px. And so the Klein-Gordon equation then becomes something quite simple. And this, of course, is uh, just the wave equation in one dimension. And so we can just set B equal to the exponential e to the i times the argument of B. And then we get B double prime is minus B. And so this is then a solution of the Klein-Gordon equation. And um, the condition that P squared plus M squared is zero then tells you that the energy is the square root of momentum squared plus mass squared. And that's the special relativistic relation for particle mass M and momentum P. Um, if you have a spinless boson um, like the Higgs boson, 
Um, then one way of writing the field we saw back in chapter four was write it like this. It satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation when, uh, because we've set P zero equal to this square root. The operators A and A dagger represent uh, annihilation and creation operators of the bosons. They obey these commutation relations. And as a result, the field obey, the field commutes with itself. Time derivatives of the field commute with themselves. And uh, the field commutes, the commutator of the field with its time derivative is I times the delta function. By the way, let me just remind you that uh, the commutator of A with B, of course, is a, and it's always like that. And um, sometimes you'll see this. This is called the anti-commutator and this is AB plus BA. And this is also sometimes written as commutator with a little plus sign. And so this one is sometimes written as commutator with a little minus sign. So these are the various notations that are used. The uh, photon, of course, is the most accessible field. Um, it's uh, what we use to see with, and um, it has four components, but um, two of them, um, are, are free components and two of them are restricted components. And um, one can make a gauge choice and one usually does a, a common gauge choice or the most common and most physical gauge choice for electrodynamics is to say the divergence of the space part of A vanishes and if you do that, then you find that the time component of the uh, four vector electromagnetic potential or electromagnetic field is a function of the charge density. And so two components of the four vector field are determined or fixed. And what's left is the other two components, and they are the two components of the photon field, which can be polarized, right circularly polarized or left circularly polarized. And um, as whereas the field for say the Higgs boson just has a, a one here and a one there, here we have um, polarization vectors. These are three vectors and they're perpendicular to P, perpendicular to P so as to satisfy the Coulomb gauge condition. Otherwise, it's, this, it's the same business with phase factors, integrals, overall momenta. And uh, this then satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, Uh, the annihilation creation operators for the photon obey the obey these uh, the annihilation operator with the creation operator gives you a delta function times a chronic delta function of spin. This s takes two values when you go on to the radiation gauge or the Coulomb gauge. Um, on the other hand, this Coulomb gauge condition you can see here it's. Um, it's a funny sort of condition. And the result is that the commutator of the field with its time derivative isn't as simple as for a scalar field. Instead, it involves this complicated extra thing, uh, which is um, called the transverse delta function. Another kind of differential equation that occurs a lot in physics is the, is the one that occurs in Dirac's equation. And this is now the free Dirac equation. And it looks like this, there's a 
field with four components. Alpha goes from one to four. And uh, this is for a described spin one half particles of mass M. And um, what Dirac did was he introduced four four by four matrices gamma. And we then have a sum over A from zero to three. So we, and we're also summing over beta uh, from one to four. These Dirac indices don't have any hidden minus signs. Only the uh, space-time indices have hidden minus signs. And the normally one suppresses the Greek indices, alpha and beta here, and you just have these four by four matrices, gamma A, and chi is just a, a field with four indexes. We don't call it a four vector because a four vector means that it transforms in a certain way over under Laurent transformations, whereas the way chi transforms, um, chi transforms the way two spin one, two spin one half fields transform. And so it's, uh, it's not a four vector. Um, the four gamma matrices of Dirac obey this magical anti-commutation relation in which eta is, so let me switch then colors here to eta is this matrix minus one, one, one with zeros everywhere else. I'm just gonna write a big zero here. So it's diagonal with um, a to zero, zero to the minus one, you might say, well, aren't the hidden minus signs here? Yeah, there are two of them. So if you raise both, you get two minus signs and they cancel. Turns out that um, solutions to the free Dirac equation are actually somewhat simpler than one um, might think, because if you have any four component field that satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation and you act on it with not the Dirac operator, but the Dirac operator with the wrong sign, then because of, um, you know, this relation where you have, um, you know, A plus B times A minus B, well, this is always A squared minus B squared. So the cross terms cancel you get this expression. You can write gamma A gamma B as the sum of the anti-commutator plus the commutator if you divide by two. The anti-commutator gives you eta with a factor of two, which then cancels. Th this term, the commutator, well, this is anti-symmetric in A and B. This is symmetric in A and B. And so that thing vanishes. So let me just show you that in a little more detail here. In other words, let's take an example. First, say gamma one with gamma one, D one, D one. Well, this is zero because the commutator of gamma one with gamma one is just gamma one squared minus gamma one squared. So that's obviously zero. What about if this is say gamma one, gamma two, D one, D two? Well, but we're summing here. So we also have to include gamma two, gamma one, D two, D one, because we're summing over both A and B. But the der derivatives commute where, um, and so this is equal to gamma one, gamma two time minus, no, plus gamma two, gamma one times gamma one, uh, times the two derivatives because derivatives commute. On the other hand, this is explicitly minus that. And so we just get zero. So this, these two things cancel. Um, so that term goes away and what one has left is just the original uh, 
Dirac uh, uh, Klein Gordon equation. And then we assume that phi satisfied the Klein Gordon equation. And so we have a solution of the Dirac equation. Then for every solution of the Klein Gordon equation, we get a solution of the Dirac equation. Well, equivalently, um, for every four solutions of the Klein Gordon equation, we get one solution of the Dirac equation. The simplest Dirac field is called a Majorana field. And um, we can write it like this. The sum is over the two spin states up, down. The operators A and B now, um, as we'll, uh, well, I was going to say, as we'll see in the chapter on group theory, but uh, because uh, there was so, so few people signed up for 467 last year. Uh, it's not being taught this year, so there's no group theory being taught this year. Um, the simplest, um, any event, uh, from group theory, you can argue that, um, well, you can read chapter, the chapter on group theory in my book and learn it that way. Anyway, um, the operators A and A dagger have to obey anti-commutation relations, not commutation relations. And of course, this means that Pauli's exclusion principle, this is, they imply Pauli's exclusion principle, namely that a dagger squared on a state automatically vanishes. This field, the simplest field described by, a, which is called a Majorana field, it um, describes a neutral particle of mass M. If um, you have two Majorana fields describing particles of the same mass, you can combine them together in a complex linear combination, and then you get a uh, charge spin one, you're describing a charge spin one half particle like a quark or a lepton, and this is called a Dirac field. So um, I've done all of these, uh, examples because um, I think they're important and they might be confusing uh, if you see them in a physics class without any explanation. Um, now we're gonna go to, as I said, this, this is a field that is it's just every little piece of the field of differential equations is different from every other part of the field. And so we're gonna jump now to first order differential equations. And here's an example of a first order differential equation. We can say dy dx is some f of x and y. And we can write that as a ratio of two functions of x and y. So we can write this as p of x and y times dx plus q of x and y dy equals zero. This is called a first order ordinary differential equation. Now, the simplest ones, to, the easiest ones to solve are the ones that are uh, separable. In other words, where P of Q, P and Q are P of X and Q of Y. And so then we can rewrite it like this. And um, of course it could have been P of Y and Q of X and we can still arrange for this to work. You get an expression like this. Now the equation is not only uh, separable, this equation is separable and here it's separated. And once the variables are separated, you can integrate. So you integrate this equation from X zero to X and from Y zero to Y. And when you do that, you still have zero and that gives you a solution. This is Y, this gives you a solution Y of X. An example uh, in a notation that's simpler is something that um, was originally noticed by Auerbach more than a hundred years ago, namely that um, many quantities are distributed 
in this way. Here, here the idea is there's a quantity that has a property X and the number of them with property X goes as dx over x to the k plus one. If um, k is not equal to zero, k is equal to zero, you get a log. If k not equal to zero, we integrate um, uh, if k is not equal to zero, we can integrate this thing. And when we integrate, we get, of course, n is a over kx uh, to the k minus a constant, or solving for x, we get this expression. And the simplest case, of course, is k equal to one, and then x is just a over n plus a constant. And turns out that this um, has many curious examples. I don't know if I should dwell on these examples, but um, it applies approximately to the populations of cities. If the largest one has population X, then the second largest has population X over two, and then X over three, then X over four. I have not actually checked this, but I think it something like that holds in general, at least if you average over enough countries and remove the outliers. Anyway, um, another example is uh, the occurrence of numbers X in a table of some sort. And um, if you work through the rest of this, you, you find out, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip the details, you can read it at your leisure. Um, in a table, you'll find more often numbers that start with one than numbers that start with nine. And the ratio of those is um, a factor of 45, actually. And um, uh, I was once sitting in a seminar that Galman gave when he was, he would give a seminar uh, here at UNM, um, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And um, one of the students was German and uh, he said, the German government uses the, uh, this information, these relations to, calc to catch tax evaders because um, in other words, people who put in that they made a charitable contribution of $9,000, that rings a, a red light goes on in the German uh, IRS. And uh, whereas if you say, oh, I made a contribution of $11,000, that goes by without as much trouble. Anyway, um, another interesting equation, and this one is perhaps more important, is the logistic equation. dy dt is ay times one minus y over capital Y. And if we let F equal Y over capital, capital I being constant, then this equation is F dot is, uh, in other words, the time derivative of F is AF times one minus F or ADT is this expression. And then you rewrite this complicated denominator and uh, like this, and then you integrate and uh, you get that and um, you take the exponential of both sides and you find this expression here. And um, this is then uh, something that uh, looks like a smooth step function. It looks basically like that. And um, uh, this point here, is where um, uh, basically where AT is somewhere near zero. Um, so um, and when AD goes, when AT is positive, uh, and then as it gets bigger than one, it this ratio becomes essentially just 
Y, everything else cancels. And so you have this height here is just capital Y. On the other hand, when AT is negative, the whole bloody thing is equal to zero because you have e to the minus, e to the, um, e to some negative number divided by Y. And so that's essentially Zippo. Um, here uh, is an example of a nonlinear problem in, well, I don't know if it's nonlinear. Anyway, it's a case of, uh, in which you can solve um, for the ground state of a, uh, of a certain kind of anharmonic oscillator or a certain class of anharmonic oscillators. And um, the trick is to, what makes this simple, what makes this doable is that it's of this form where you have W plus IP. Um, and if you multiply that out, it looks like this or this. And so it's basically a, a one-dimensional quantum mechanics problem with a curious potential where V is W squared minus W prime divided by some constant. And um, W prime meaning dW dx. And the wave function of the ground state uh, Uh, if, you if you find a ground state that's annihilated by this expression, then you have an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with energy zero. Um, and uh, so that, what is the equation? It's zero is X W plus IP. IP gives us H bar times derivative. This is just W. So then we have a, an equation of the form psi prime over psi, which is d log psi dx equals minus w over x. That tells us that the log of psi, so this tells us, um, let's see, I'll switch maybe to black. So this tells us that um, log psi is equal to minus the integral W of X prime, DX prime up to X and um, exponentiating, we then get Psi of X equals E to the minus and putting in the H bar, we get zero to X uh, W of X prime, DX prime. And um, this is actually is an overall constant Psi zero. So this is the ground state of this uh, uh, Hamiltonian. And this can be quite a, quite a uh, subtle uh, problem if you don't use this trick. Um, however, this only works as long as this function is square integrable. So this W has to perform, has to be reasonable. Um, in other words, um, if you had, for example, W equal to X squared, then you'd be in trouble because then what you'd get would be, Psi would be something like E to the minus, the integral of X squared would be, damn it, it's so annoying the way this, thing constantly goes to erasure. This would be e to the minus x cubed over three h bar essentially. And you see that's uh, that square integrable on the right hand on the for positive x, but not for negative x. And so this um, uh, not square integrable, or if you want, not Lebesgue square integrable, L2 is easier to write than square integrable, just so many letters. Um, on the other hand, if W was an odd function of X or a polynomial in which the leading term is odd in X, then you get something that is square integrable. For example, if N is equal to zero, you just get the ordinary harmonic oscillator and the, and the solution is this, uh, well, 
the ordinary harmonic oscillator, which I discussed in chapter one, I think. If on the other hand, you take uh, W as X cubed, you get this expression. And so it goes as uh, E to the minus X to the fourth. And this is the ground state for this particular Hamiltonian. And you can even find the mean value of X squared in the ground state as being uh, this. Um, tell you the truth, I don't remember how I figured that out. So I will not try to explain it immediately. Um, another example of a differential equation is um, uh, something that um, is referred to as scaling. Uh, the, the way in which a step size varies with coupling constant in lattice chromodynamics. Uh, those who do that for a living uh, tell us goes like this, where B beta looks like that. And um, so, um, for example, in the simplest case, you have DG D log A equal to, um, if this, if beta is minus B zero G cube, you have beta zero G cube dropping in the higher order terms. You then integrate that and you find this expression here, lambda constant of integration. And so that tells you that the lattice spacing has to go to zero very rapidly um, as uh, G goes to zero, in fact, uh, that's an essential singularity. On the other hand, what it says is that for large values of G, strong coupling, you can get away with a large lattice spacing. If, if this is really valid, then uh, that tells you that you can you can take all of, put all of the universe in a cube of in a, in a not a cube but a hypercube of 10 to the fourth spaces in each of the four directions of space and time and um, approximate quantum chromodynamics at strong coupling. Um, and that was uh, the, an advance that Kreutz made. In fact, he published his program in either Fortran or C, I don't remember, uh, in PhysRev about, about uh, what was it? Maybe 50, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, something like that. Um, anyway, the idea that the strength of the interaction, yeah, if you, if you rewrite the interaction, you know, uh, the, the coupling constant this way, you see the coupling constant goes to zero as A goes to, um, as A goes to zero, the log grows and, and then you take the square root, you put it in the denominator. And so the coupling constant goes down as the lattice spacing shrinks, but the, 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 uh, the diminution of the coupling constant is only logarithmic. Um, and uh, in continuum gauge theory, what one says is that um, the strength of the interaction goes down with the energy as the energy of the process goes up, energy being inverse distance. Um, and uh, this uh, were this holds, but it's logarithmic. And uh, so that's not a big change. Um, Often, of course, the separability is not obvious if you just are given a differential equation, a first order differential equation, you might not realize that uh, it's differentiable. Um, on the other hand, if P and Q can both be factored, then uh, it is separable. And then you just divide 
by, in this particular case, R of X and V of Y, and bingo, you've got the thing separate, function of X, function of Y, both have to be a constant, you integrate. And uh, so an example is this uh, equation here looks a little bit frightening, but then you divide by the Y for this guy and the X for that guy, and you get this expression. Integrating, you get two log terms and uh, you can then solve why is the square root C being an arbitrary constant of integration. Um, let's see, we haven't had a question uh, and we've been going over an hour. Um, well, of course, I also stupidly forgot to put up chat. So here's a chat window. So, um, Maybe somebody would like to uh, put a chat message in or ask a question in chat or just um, speak, you know, unmute yourself and speak the question. All right. Um, Let's, let's now look at exact first order differential equations then. Um, what does exact mean? Well, exact means that the left-hand side of the differential equation, in other words, the thing that's equal to zero is PDX plus QDY, that this is actually the differential of something. And if it's a differential of something, then you can write it as d phi as the x derivative of phi times dx plus the y derivative of phi times dy. Um, or alternatively, uh, in other words, we can say d phi is um, grad phi dot uh, dr where uh, here, here dr is uh, dx dy. Um, so the criteria of exactness then are that p has to be the derivative of something with respect to x and q has to be the derivative of something with respect to y. And but then you know that the derivative of the second derivative uh, is doesn't care whether you differentiate first with respect to x or first with respect to y. And so we have P is partial phi partial X, Q is partial phi partial Y, then the Y derivative of P, which is the second mixed derivative of phi is the same as the X derivative of Q because that's also the mixed derivative of phi. And so PY has to equal QX. So that's the condition of integrability. And, um, so um, this implies that the uh, ODE is exact. And uh, if it's exact, then we can integrate it. Um, now, a first order uh, ODE that's separable and separated like that is exact because PY is zero, PX is zero, QX is zero. And so it's exact. Um, on the other hand, a first order ODE can be exact without being separable. And um, well, we have a minute left, maybe I should give an example here. Boyle's law at fixed temperature changes in pressure and volume and ideal gas are related this way, fixed temperature. This is exact because uh, PDV plus VDP, well, this is D of PV. And the integrated form 
is the ideal gas law. PV is something else, and that's NKT, N being the number of molecules in the gas, K being Boltzmann's constant. Von der Waals, and I think this was in his thesis, or is it Van der Waals? Anyway, um, what he said was, well, let's um, put in an a, another term representing the attraction of the molecules and another term, a second term, representing the volume of the molecules. And there we will have a more accurate uh, equation. And this was a sign that molecules were real particles because back in the um, 19th century, uh, um, physicists were somewhat arrogant, many of them, and they um, thought the chemists were fooling themselves with their equations um, in which they balance both sides of the equation and talk about molecules, write things like CO2 and talk about them as being one carbon and two oxygen atoms and so forth. And uh, the reality of molecules uh, was in fact, um, Finally accepted after Einstein in 1905, related something called the viscous friction coefficient, which can be measured, and the diffusion constant, which can also be measured, to KT. And it was uh, zeta D is KT. That's chapter 15. Again, uh, you can read about it, but we're not teaching it. I will teach a seminar next semester it's called a 500 seminar, one credit, and it's credit, no credit, no um, homework, no exams, uh, just uh, try to learn what you can. Um, and I'll cover some things in the second half of the book and possibly other things. Anyway, um, so this is one of Einstein's many contributions, um, which, I mean, it's just quite amazing how many things he did. Um, all right, well, we're out of time. So I'm, uh, is there a final question? No, apparently. So I'm gonna stop share and